Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the, let's see, what is it? Ninth day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. Um, I just got off Twitter slash X. And you know, they have to add an option. They really need an option. Musk, you need to add an option. You need to add an, the option of muting reposts of people that you're, you subscribe to. Because there's people out there that just bomb it with reposts, especially when they're in a panic. Or, you know, people just too lazy to write. They just, well, I like that. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Rather than writing their own posts, like Ben Shapiro, let's put it that way. You would think Ben, who is pretty articulate, and he's not a stupid person, but he is he is repost bombing X. Okay, I, just because I subscribe to someone doesn't mean I agree with them. But yeah, you know, I've I've subscribed to a couple of the Gang of Four, or what do they call them themselves? The uh, uh, you have uh, Acasio, AOC, and then you have a couple others. Because the reason why I did that is because um, one of them is a Palestinian, and the other one uh, is uh, is Muslim from the Middle East, and. You know, sometimes people you don't agree with on many things, you can agree with on some things. And what's going on in Gaza, what Israel is doing, I agree with them on it. And they, I, I saw, they, I'm not going to put the stuff on the screen, but one of them uh, posted something about, I'm so proud of my colleagues. And there was a picture of some of the uh, uh, congressmen uh, assembled on the steps of the, uh, uh, the Capitol building. Uh, with a banner about uh, uh, ceasefire. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I put I sent a response, and I said, well, where's the rest of the Congress? Because it wasn't even all that. It was hardly, you know, it was a handful of people. You know, maybe, maybe two dozen at most. The whole Congress should be there. They should be out banging on the White House door saying, you idiot, ceasefire now. Uh, and that would, you know, this, this, we have to blow through some of this smoke, the political smoke, uh, the Biden and Blinken and these people that are talking about a humanitarian ceasefire. Oh yeah. Let's pause it for three days and then resume the murder, the genocide. Cause that's what's, what's going on. And Ben Shapiro, you know, people, things come along like, like this in particular. And you're forced to take a side. There is no neutrality in this. There can be no neutrality about genocide. There can, this is out and out genocide. By definition, this is genocide. Uh, you know, and, and it is ethnic cleansing, overt ethnic cleansing has been going on since prior to, even prior to 1948, prior to the, to the, uh, so-called establishment of Israel, which was, you know, Israel, the the uh, area that was in Jewish control there at that time, they didn't, they declared their independence, and then the struggle began, and the United Nations recognized them as an independent nation. Uh, that portion, <laughs> you know, there was a plan, but it was, it was not, see, the problem with the, uh, with the partition plan of of 1947, which was not an official, it was more like a suggestion. Uh, the, U the United Nations, they're impotent, especially when one of the five permanent members decides to block it. So like the General Assembly, they can suggest things, <laughs> approve things, but they have no power. It's, it's a, the UN is really a scam to keep the five in control, the five allies. It was, it's really, the United Nations was what the allies in World War II called themselves, the United Nations as opposed to the Axis. And then after the war, they just said, well, now that we've done this, the whole world belongs to us. Let's set up a system to maintain peace and our order, our peace and our order. Uh, <laughs> just what they did. So it's set up in such a way, the deck is stacked 
so that the five, the, the so-called victors, you know, you have the United States, the Soviet Union, you have China, uh, originally nationalist China, <laughs> because the revolution hadn't occurred there yet. And uh, uh, th there was a fighting that was still going on. I should say that the, the, victor, the victory of the communists hadn't occurred uh, yet, but it was well on its way. Uh, let's see what else. You had France and you had, had Britain, <laughs> the has-been empires, and that's it. And, of course, uh, Japan, no. <laughs> Germany, no. Italy, no. You're on the outs. And then you had the, the General Assembly. And you had, you had the 10 rotating members, where, what, I think it's a two-year term on the council, but they don't have the power of veto. So the five, they're the five big ones, and they can shut everything down whenever they want just by vetoing things. And the Security Council, the Security Council is where the stuff actually happens. However, there is a way around that. And the General Assembly, uh, individual nation states, and this is one of the things the United States has used with the coalition of the willing, uh, can or a coalition of states acting in the interest of peace can act without uh, prior to an action by the uh, Security Council, um, especially because the wheels move very slowly at the UN. I mean, they have to. The Security Council, for example, they won't even bring forth a resolution usually unless it's all agreed to secretly in advance because it makes them look bad. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, or they can have a vote just to make a member look bad, like the United Nations, the states, because, yeah, we're going to take a vote just to prove you're obstructing everything, which the United States does. Uh, and during the, uh, the Cold War, which wasn't always the Cold War was only cold when it came to direct contact between the United States and the Soviet Union. It was not cold in other places like uh, Vietnam, like uh, Afghanistan, like Cuba, like other places. You know, we, yeah. uh, South America, Central America, Nicaragua, other places. You had the forces. Well, there was a conflict of ideologies, and I'm not sure how different the ideologies actually were because the United States, uh, in practice, was a, uh, a uh, atheistic, materialistic society in that there is no God. There's no, there is no official God of the United States other than money. Uh, it was atheistic materialism versus... Uh, uh, atheistic capitalist materialism versus atheistic communist materialism. <laughs> both Western ideologies. And both with false promises. Happiness through materialism. Both sides, really, the same thing. Happiness through government. Both sides, the same thing. Because they both actually, by that time, were, you know, what is the difference about, it was only a difference about power. It was only a difference about dominion. It's like, who's going to be the, 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 the king of the hill? That's all it was. Bunch of children playing king of the hill and killing everybody in the process. So that's really, it, it was a, uh, the, the idea that the United States is free was, well, rapidly disappearing. I mean, this was... At the height of the Cold War, you had things like Joseph McCarthy in the Senate and the, the McCarthy witch trials. We've seen a repeat of that now. This time it's, I don't remember, was McCarthy, McCarthy a Democrat or Republican? It hardly makes a difference. He was from Wisconsin. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's the same. Well, there is no difference between the Democrats and Republicans usually. Not real. It's not really. It's just flavors, Fla a difference of flavors. Uh, but uh, back to the present reality. Ben Shapiro's in a in utter panic because you can you can tell he, the the insanity of his tweets, the utter insanity. He's in a panic about Israel, and he's 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 
bombing, uh, he's repost bombing Twitter with every bit of uh, pro-Israel propaganda he can see. Every time he sees one, he just reposts it, reposts it, reposts it. So just, just trying to fill everything up. That's the, the, uh, that's the evidence of a person in a panic, a person that's not of the truth. Otherwise, if he, was, if he really knew that Israel was in the right and he had a, a good argument based on truth, that's what he'd be presenting. He wouldn't re be reposting mindless, idiotic propaganda from the official propaganda from Israel, which is the other evidence that Israel's in a panic. And they're, they're like in a, a panic of a man that's taken hostages in a bank and uh, trying to get out of there with a, and has shot some of the hostages trying to get out of there without dying himself. That's really what they are, you know, surrounded by the police and uh, saying, no, I'm not coming out. I'm going to—I I, I demand an airplane. I demand a bus, or I'm going to kill the hostages one by one, you know, that kind of stuff. That's what Israel's doing now. They're, they're in that kind of a panic mode uh, because they're not in the truth. They're, they're, they're not in the right, and they know it. They know it. Deep down, they know it. People, in spite of all your efforts to, to disable your conscience— it still manages to to squeak now and then, and even even in Israel. Uh, but th this is exposing people. It's, you know, I used to listen to Ben Shapiro for a while. Then I realized he's just another political hack because he's not really speaking truth. Sometimes people that are political hacks are just advocates for a position. They do say things that are true, and you might listen to them because they're saying something you agree with because it may be true. But their purpose is not to, to communicate the truth. They don't love the truth. They just use the truth when it's convenient. And when it's not convenient, they use lies. That's another word for a politician, I think. Uh, they're not particular about truth. And the scripture is very clear that, that if you don't have the love of the truth, you can't be saved. I mean, you, uh, if you don't love truth, lo loving truth in itself does not save you, but it, it brings you close to God because God is truth. You're not far from salvation. You're not far from God if you love truth because it'll eventually lead you to the one who is truth. But if you don't love truth, if you love lies, well, <laughs> You're of, you're of the other one. You're of the liar, the, the uh, adversary of God, Satan. He is the father of lies. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who is God, said he is the father of lies. So uh, <laughs> this stuff, when this kind of stuff comes up, it shows people's true colors. What, are, what side are you on? Are you in the side of truth? Are you in the side of compassion? Are you in the side of, of God? Or are you in the side of the others? And it's just, just like uh, uh, Talib, I believe is her name, that's a Palestinian. Question is, just because you're supporting a ceasefire doesn't mean you're on the side of right, necessarily. It's just what's right in this circumstance is obvious. However, does that mean you're always on that side, or is it just a matter of convenience in this case? Do you love truth, or do you have a vested interest here and you just happen to be supporting what is right out of convenience, not because you're seeking what is right. It just happens to coincide with your position and other things. I don't know. I don't know. But at least they're saying something in this circumstance. And to not say something in this circumstance is a criminal act itself. Uh, in fact, I, I saw, what was it? Uh, was that yesterday? No, it was yesterday. The the White House officially put out a a video on on X on Twitter. They've got to change their their um, their what do you call it the the address? It's not really the address. They're the universal link to the address from X to Twitter because this is or Twitter to X because this is sort of it's still Twitter dot com. But that somehow they need to transition that or, or mirror that so you can just not have to say that. 
eliminate the confusion there. Uh, and they can. You can actually have two of those written IDs. I forgot what you call them uh, uh, at the moment. That go to the same site. The same. Well, actually, in that case, they go to. Well, I don't want to get into the actual logic of web servers. <laughs> But yeah, you can't. You can have uh, things go to the same place, mirrored uh, names, internet name, I guess you can call it. Uh, but uh, people out there know what I mean. I know what I mean. I just can't think of it at the moment. Uh, URLs. But uh, the actual address is a number. I think it's what is it? Ten digits now. They have two. One's an, an ar archaic, uh, the original that they ran out of numbers, so they expanded it. I didn't need to tell you that. But this, the, uh, Ben Shapiro's in a panic. You can tell just the way he acts. And his, he's just spouting nonsense. I mean, he's not a stupid guy, He's in, which is why I used to like to listen to him once in a while. And his, his Daily Wire, that whole group over there is like, no. They are... They're just partisans. And I stopped listening to him when I realized he's just a partisan. He doesn't actually defend the truth. He's just a partisan. He only speaks what supports his view. He's a debater. Debaters are not honest people. Debaters will use all kinds of things to win. That's not an honest person. They don't love the truth. They have a, it's a game they're trying to win. A debate is a sporting event. Back to the sporting event I saw on Twitter yesterday. White House, in the midst of what's going on in the world right now. See, this is, it's like on, on YouTube. By the way, I turned my ad blockers back on, and I'm not having the pop-up warning messages, so... <laughs> Maybe maybe it was a temporary thing, and they backed off on that because I think they were getting pushback. You know, you know if they um, if they change their it's YouTube is supposed to be social media, right? Like Twitter and Facebook. This, these are supposed to be social media things. There needs to be some reforms to get back to social media. And to eliminate the corruption of money, which is, it's like politics. As long as American politics depends on donations uh, of large magnitude, it is inherently corrupt. It is not democracy at all. It's not, rep the, the representatives in Washington do not represent the American people. They represent their donors. It is not de representative democracy. It is pay for service. That is a fact. It requires so much money to run for any office. And if there's unless there was a limitation, so, okay, no one can donate more than $100 or something like that to a candidate, something that would, would be of a, a, a level that would not uh, indebt the candidate to particular things. And corporations have to be, uh-uh, you are not eligible to vote. Organizations, uh-uh. No, it's just individuals or preferably public financing. Considering how much money we waste on the military and all kinds of other things, public financing would be a, not even a drop in the bucket. you got to get the corruption out of it, but you have to do it in such a way that, that little people can actually run too. It can't be uh, a, a duopoly of two parties. It has to be set up in such a way that that citizens, American citizens, have can do it, can participate in it. Of course, you have to weed them out somehow, too, that's fair. You know, and the debate structure, isn't it? 
but obviously, you, there, there, you know, there have there are petitions or something like that. You have to be able to demonstrate you have enough people want you to run, uh, some way to do it. But uh, we have to find out some way to get the money out of it, or we, because right now it is not a democracy; it's a fascist state. When corporations can give money, it's fascism because you have the corporations buy the politicians, put them in office, and then they own them. Because unlike, you know, it, the, the, the corporations and the special interests, and I'm talking about unions too, because they are corporations too. Uh, they're just not necessarily for profit, although they do. All the nonprofits also are for profit. Just how act, look at how they act. Like hospitals that keep expanding and expanding. They have their own little kingdoms they're trying to build. What in the world is going on there? They act just like for profit uh, corporations trying to establish monopolies. <sighs> there's, there's some problems in society. Um, like the technological imperative, which is the idea that if you can do something, you must do it. If if the technology exists to do something, then you must do it. You have an obligation to do it, regardless of the cost. No, it's it's simply not rational, uh, because the, the problem with that too is say. The problem with people have with compassion is so you have compassion for say a criminal because he's in a bad situation and you can you can empathize with that you can put yourself in that place and oh but you have to keep in, you have to be compassionate to society as a whole too you have to realize that when you say spend one million dollars on prolonging the life of a person maybe a month or two months or three months or or a year that People are already terminal. I mean, we're uh, death is universal. That and th this sounds this sounds bad, but we have to face the reality of it. That when you take money and put it on one individual because of the case or something, you feel compassion for them. What about all that? That money is finite, and you're taking it from everybody else too. So there's a principle in business, and I don't want to reduce this to business, but we have to be realistic in some ways because we're dealing in this world. We have finite resources, and you have to allocate those resources in a rational way. Uh, uh, capitalism is not rational allocation. Socialism is not very good at rational uh, application either. But there has to be, we need the wisdom of God. That's what we need. But so if you take, put a million dollars into saving the life of someone, okay, but that million dollars is not available for maybe that would, that, that million dollars spread out might save the life of a thousand people, like pro prolong their lives by, and the, and the, and the sum of the good by not dumping it all in one thing on one person might be much higher for society than the one. So how do we, you know, this is, this is a difficult moral system, but we have to look at the, not only the individual, but also society in general. Not only for your own interest, but the interest of others. See, not just one, you can see the, the homeless man on the street corner and you can feel compassion for him, but you have to understand it, too, and you have to act with wisdom. And you also, and I know from personal long experience, that compassion can sometimes be dangerous uh, for the person you're, being, you're showing compassion to because you can simply be doing things that make you feel good but enable them to continue in that situation because sometimes it's something they need to do and it's easy just to stay where you are sometimes for example um, many 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 of the people that are homeless are drug addicts 
or alcohol, you know, drugs in one form or another. And many, many, many of the homeless that aren't, there are other issues. I mean, there's some mental issues. Uh, they are, some of them should be institutionalized, truly. I mean, there are people that have like borderline personality disorder. They're, well, they're, they're not terribly a danger to society, but they're on the edge where they, they will do things that um, you should not incarcerate people because of what they might do. But, I mean, we have to, we have to, uh, Our system is broken. I mean, the, the 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 legal system is broken. The 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 punishment prisons are broken. They cause more destruction. To I mean, if a, a, a say a man ends up in prison, but he's married. Well, if he's married and has children, and uh, you know, in in the Bible, especially for property crimes, there is no imprisonment. There is no uh, capital of. Uh, there's no murder or there's no execution for property crimes. Uh, there's restitution is what's required. And sometimes, depending on the seriousness of the property crime, how how dangerous it was, destructive it was to the person that was the, the, the sin was against, and it is a sin. Uh, like if you stole his means of livelihood, like you stole his oxen or his semi-tractor or something like that in a modern equivalent, that that required sevenfold restoration, whereas a a normal, relatively insignificant theft was uh, you had to restore twice to that person, to the victim, not to the state. This idea of the state is like it's, you know, there's what's the state? It is a concept. It's not a reality. It's a concept. People are real. The state is fiction. It is a legal fiction. It's an idea. It's like the border between the United States and Mexico. Actually, that is only a fiction. It's a, it's a myth. In fact, it's a myth too. But I mean, it's only a idea. It doesn't, there's not a reality. There is not a, a physical gap between Mexico and the United States. It's a line on a map. It's a political thing. It is not a part of creation. You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> that a lot of these things that, that we hold and fight for are not really worth it. <laughs> but again, there has to be a, a certain wisdom in how we allocate resources, how society allocates resources. And, and, and also wisdom in in allocating them such a way that it produces a positive effect rather than a negative one. Uh, again, uh, in, in incarceration for property offenses is, is not right. Biblically, it's not right. It's not just. If, if it's not right according to God's word, it's not just. Because he is justice. He is righteousness. And if he says something is right, then it's right. So it's, but how do you, how do you, uh, how, how do you, now, especially in the New Testament, the idea is God is not simply trying to enforce a law. He's trying to produce good because God is good. God is merciful. God is, 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 desires all men to be saved. So if we don't understand that, and that, I think that was part of the original idea of penitentiaries, but meh. in practice, it was a bad idea uh, because they were just using human wisdom uh, it's just like a place where you put people where they can become penitent and realize their errors. And no, you cannot bring that about by by power. It has to be God that has to work in there. The problem's in the heart, and that's something that we can't change. You can apply uh, force and discipline and punishment to condition people to to not do what is wrong, but it doesn't change their heart. They still want to do the same things. That's why the 12-step programs and all that stuff doesn't work, because it, 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 only God can change your heart. You have to appeal to him. 
And if you don't want to do that, well, there's, there's, at some point, people become a danger to society and they have to be locked up and uh, for the safety of others. So at some point, that's, but property crimes, you know, again, the, the, the restitution was a punishment. It wasn't restoring what you stole. It was restoring at least twice what you stole. And if you didn't do it, you got sold into slavery until until you paid it off. I was forced labor. So, or, or your family paid it off or something. And that was, uh, it, then they would punish you. Yeah, sort of the boot camp discipline system, which is a collective punishment, but. But, but, but the, uh, like the incarceration system, it, it does destroy the families. And that, uh, of course, this society right now has completely lost the concept of the importance of, of the family, which is the foundation of society, and doing everything they can to destroy it. Back to the White House Twitter thing. So in the midst of this in-your-face genocide that's being played out before the entire world uh you have this madness going on israel their their their, their propaganda is utter, utterly insane i mean th these people are and you can tell they're in a panic because what they're saying is so bizarre that it's incredible but what does the white house put out they have biden meeting a group of football players and family and concerned people about the the safety dangers in playing football, you know, helmet issues and things like that. these people. For, for, first of all, if you're a professional football player, you're a bit of a prostitute because you're selling your body for money and fame, and you're doing something you know is dangerous. So in a free society, well, you got what you pay. You got paid for it. You you sold yourself. You're engaged in an activity that is, you know, there should be disclosure that if you play this game, you might end up with these things. But in the two, why does why is society so addicted to just a, a rehash of the the gladiators and the Colosseum of Rome? Why is there so much love for it? And the, the love of money being the root of all evil, professional sports. Yeah. But the, this was just just bizarre seeing the White House put out this in the midst of what's going on in Gaza. It's just like YouTube with their stupid little ads and their stupid little idiotic video games. They're trying to get you to click on the ads in the midst of what you're seeing going on in Gaza and the West Bank. Of course, this kind of stuff goes on other places, too. But now it's you know it's just right in our face and you can't avoid it unless you're uh, spiritually dead because you don't care. <sighs> but it's just just so inconsistent with because Biden can pick up the phone and he can stop it now. That's what's that's what's so morally repugnant about this whole situation. The United States has enough leverage on Israel. We're their patron. We are the patron of Israel. So if United States, so what did Biden do when this started? Immediately he starts sending C-17 military transports over there with more bombs. So Israel doesn't run out of bombs to bomb Gaza with. And I don't think Biden has enough mental capacity left after being 30 years in the Senate, let alone, you know, the effects of old age and lack of moral character for his entire life, apparently, uh, to to see the problem with that. So what is wrong with you? Of course, he, he probably bought, well, he did. He repeated Netanyahu's lies about the 40 beheaded babies, which was all a lie. It has been publicly exposed as a lie. The, uh, the, the Israeli military refused to acknowledge that as, an, as a fact. They said, no, we can't, we can't verify that. Uh, because it was spread, we know there was a particular settler who was part of the IDF. 
don't know if he reserves or whatever. He was spreading that story around in order to incite violence against the Palestinians. We know that. Gray Zone did a good expose on it. Yeah, with a picture of the guy. I said, yeah, I heard that guy on videos saying that very thing. It was him in an IDF uniform. Yep. So it was one hateful individual deliberately spreading propaganda to incite violence against the Palestinians. And as I've looked over the material that mostly the IDF has put out, drone videos, uh, especially still shots of the destruction, I, I've come to the conclusion that the IDF killed most of those civilians. Yes, Hamas took hostages. But if you look at those videos where they're taking hostages, they're not gunning down everybody else that's running there. They're grabbing people for a particular reason because the Israel is holding in excess of 7,000 Palestinians in prison in, or in administrative detention, as they call it, that basically, uh, so they're, they were grabbing hostages to exchange them for all the ones that Israel's, Israel's holding. These aren't people uh, that have been committed crimes and prosecuted legally with due process for legitimate crimes, but political prisoners. often with no legal action at all, just administrative detention. We don't like you. You're a Palestinian. Off to the camp you go. Off to prison you go. Not meant to mention the fact that the entire Gaza Strip is a prison. Israel turned it into a prison. No two ways about that. Well, now, now Israel's gone off the deep end. The official Israel government Twitter channel putting out propaganda talking about how Israel has deployed IDF forces in Gaza to, to facilitate the safe passage of the population to the south, protecting them from Hamas. Is that, is it, does that correspond with reality at all? That's why is, is Israel's out there with their tanks and their drones and their aircraft dropping bombs on convoys of people. In fact, uh, the, the Palestinians aren't even trying to drive a vehicle anymore to the south. They're walking on foot because they know if Israel sees a vehicle moving, they, they, they destroy the vehicle on the supposed safe, uh, safe routes. So the law, Israel is not actually trying to get them to move south, south safely at all. Their actions demonstrate they're just out to kill Palestinians. The more the better. And so the propaganda comes out saying, well, we're actually deploying our forces in, in Gaza to facilitate the, the, the civilians, their safe passage and their safety, and to protect them from harm, to protect them from Hamas. Hamas wants to kill them. Israel wants to save them. Really? You think we're all idiots, right? Yeah, see, that's a that, just, that just demonstrates what Israel thinks about the rest of the world. They think we're worthless idiots that will believe that kind of utter nonsense. I don't know if the Germans even turned out nonsense that bad. Goebbels, was he ever that crazy? Talk about the big lie. And the other thing is, like, wait a minute. It's so Israel's complaining about Hamas using the Palestinians as... as uh, human shields, and that puts the, the civilians in harm's way. I had to respond to that one, too. I responded to the other one, too, I think. Uh, but I had to respond to that. Wait a minute. What is the harm they're in the way of? The Israeli bombs. You're dropping 2,000-pound jams on, on Palestine to protect them from Hamas. Really? So, so where is the harm that the civilians are subject to. Now, Hamas isn't using them as human shields. You're making them into an obstacle for your bombs, and you don't care that they're there. 
This is just bullshit of the worst kind. Actually, it's more like chicken poo, <laughs> which is worse. This is just nonsense. And Israel to even throw out this kind of in-your-face lies? Really? They're out gobbling gobbles. Who was the minister of propaganda for the Nazis? I'm I'm sure that the Nazis were all putting the the Jews and the and the Gypsies and the Slavs, the Poles and the Russian POWs into those death camps in order to protect them from the Americans and from the Brits and from their own countrymen. Right? Right? Is that what they were doing it for? Well, that's what they're, that's what Israel's doing in Gaza. That's what they say they're doing. We're there to protect the Palestinians. Yeah, like you've been protecting them for the last 75 years with ethnic cleansing. There's no doubt about it. I mean, this is obvious. I didn't know this until this came up and I started looking at the facts, looking at the history. And then, like, you look at these things, and there's claims. In, well, that one makes sense. That one doesn't. The facts of history. Undeniable. There are different interpretations, but the actual facts are undeniable. It's like the fact that the Palestinians were living there for generations, 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 and then a bunch of Europeans come there and steal their land and expel them, often violently, often massacring villages. See, these things, you know, the American media doesn't make movies about the plight of the Palestinians, the plight of the, the Christian villages that were expelled and massacred and everything else by the Jews, too. We don't hear about that. We don't hear about that from the Christian Zionists, from these, these from the Christian community at large, the, the, the fundamentalists and the dispensationalists. We don't know anything about this stuff. The evangelicals, we're not told about this stuff. Nobody cares about it, apparently. They don't care about Christians being persecuted and ethnically cleansed by Israel, expelled from their own uh, villages, and not allowed to return, we don't hear about that. Why? Why? Franklin Graham? Billy Graham? Why? I, I sort of, I've got Franklin Graham on my to follow him, too, to see if he says anything that makes sense. And no, no. Just like his daddy, they tend to be pursuing the uh, politically correct side of things. Tend to be, the, Billy Graham liked to hobnob with presidents. He would rather be with the presidents, walk with the presidents, and walk through the, the streets of inner Chicago or something like that. I would rather walk the streets of Chicago, of inner, the bad sides of Chicago, than walk in Washington, D.C., in the capital areas. At least you might see truth there. I'd rather sit down on a bench and talk to a homeless guy any day than talk with any of these politicians. They're more honest. And we're honest. Talk to him and say, "Yeah, I'm." I was talking to one guy in in Danville over here. Went out early in the morning. I was taking photographs. Hobby, and uh, I said, "Would you mind if I took your photograph?" He said, "Sure." I, and uh, I, I don't really want to publish it necessarily, unless it has a purpose. But uh, interesting guy, older guy. Um, sitting there on the bench and start talking with him. And he said, yeah, I made some decisions. I said, why are you out here? He said, well, I made some bad decisions in my life. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized that there, there's people, you, you can't simply change the environment uh, because their lifestyle is really the street. Uh, they, they are 
You put them. You can put them in a different environment. And I've done this. I've done, I've learned this the hard way. You can change the environment, but you don't change the heart. You don't change the habits. They will go right back to what they were at, and then they'll come to you and you know say, "Help me, help me." Well, I tried. I, I can't do anymore. Uh, you, 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 unless you go, to, only God can help you. And if you're not willing to to surrender yourself into His hands and cry out to Him to save you from yourself, see, people want to be saved from the consequences of their sins, but they don't want to be saved from themselves, the source of their sins. Sin is not something outside of you; it comes from you. That's that's why we're called sinners, because we are people that do these things. It, we are the source. We are the tree that bears the bad fruit, which is why we must be born again. <sighs> but the, this, this, what's going on in Gaza now is the kind of thing that exposes people's true colors. And again, people can be siding with the, with the Palestinians because they are a Palestinian, Shapiro siding with Israel because he's a practicing, obviously a practicing Orthodox Jew. He's got the yarmulke all the time, basically a a symbol saying, "I'm a practicing Orthodox Jew." Um, so he he wears he wears his religion not on his sleeve but on the top of his head. Uh, so. Uh, even though he doesn't say that out loud, usually he's, you know, you can say, yes, he's a practicing Orthodox Jew. He wears it on his head. But why is he supporting Israel? Because Israel's truly in the right? Because Israel is, is the state of Israel is acting according to the, the revealed will of God in the law and the prophets? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They are committing genocide. And when Netanyahu uses Amalek, which I, I did discover the other day that there is a connection to Amalek that's not biblical. It has to do with what's on the menorah in front of the Knesset, which is probably more where he got that. I doubt if that, spends, that man spends a lot of time reading the Bible. But using that and the, the meaning that people that look in the Bible for Amalek uh, as compared to what's on the menorah, apparently it's a it's like a a symbol of the generational struggle with enemies. Uh, <laughs> you know, so th th let me I have to say so in front. If this proves that that Israel is not a religious uh, Jewish entity at all, too, they got this menorah which is. Uh, the menorah was the seven-branched lamp in the temple, in the in the holy place, not the holy of holies. Uh, that is part of the the furniture of the of the this, the uh, uh, the temple or the what do they what do they call this tent one? I can't remember now, but it doesn't matter. But it's 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 not the 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 furniture is not what's important. God is what's important, not the building, God. And for, for a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the Jews that I've had interaction with, they don't know God. I've never met a, new, a Jew that knows God. I've never, I've not, I haven't met too many Christians that know God either, to tell the truth. But the interaction I've had with them, they're all excited, you know, like to them, the greatest king was Solomon because of the wealth and power of Israel at that time. It was a fairly large uh, area, and they had dominion over a lot of the nations around them. Uh, but Solomon was a disaster as a king because he, he's the one that led Israel into uh, idolatry because he violated God's law. In the law, it says you're not to multiply your wives. You're not to multiply your chariots. In other words, you're not, you're not supposed to uh, be engaged with continual intercourse with a bunch of foreign women. In other words, you were, you were entangling yourself 
for political reasons. Let's, let's understand this. Uh, the multiple women was a, uh, to take a wife of a foreign, of a royal family from some other nation was uh, political diplomacy. You know, you had, so you had marriage ties, which was supposed to prevent conflict. It didn't in World War II, and all, basically all the royal families, like the, the family in Germany was related very closely to the family. They were like cousins with the, fa the royal family of England. It didn't prevent the war, did it? No, of course not. But So that's why he had all the women and the concubines. It was for political reasons. It's human wisdom, not God's wisdom. God said, don't do that. Well, Solomon thought he was wiser than God, so he did it. Don't multiply your chariots. Why? Because when you depend on military force, which the state of Israel is doing, and the United States. The United States, you know, we keep hearing this, this mantra about the military. Well, they've kept us safe. They've kept us free. That is a lie. That is an absolute lie. That is an in-your-face denial of what God has told us. No, our freedom, our liberty depends on a relationship with God, not how strong our military is. And when you don't get that right, you'll end up enslaved, like we are now, really. This is not a free nation. We are in all kinds of slavery in the United States, various forms of slavery. That's just not obvious, but it's there. Slaves of sin, foremost. Slaves of debt. Slave, <laughs> you know, this whole society is all you, you, consumers. You got to go into debt for everything. Buy, 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 buy. This, we're, we're enslaved to all kinds of things. Enslaved to, to drugs, enslaved to media, to entertainment, to football, professional sports. What a bizarre idea, professional sports. We're not a free people. We don't trust in God. We trust in other things. So is Israel. Israel doesn't trust in God. Back to that menorah. It's covered with images, carved images, reliefs, three-dimensional images, forbidden by the law of God. You can't do that. And they take an article of the temple, the menorah, and they cover it with, with, uh, with images of things like Amalek and things like uh, Simon Bar Kokhba and... Then they got the Ten Commandments on there, too. God forbids you to make that thing. The, the hypocrisy, the, the blindness of the state of Israel. The absolute blindness. The absolutely, they're, they're, they are without God. They're cut off. Biblically, they're cut off. Uh, people have asked me about, uh, are, are they... Still God's people under the old covenant, under the covenant of Moses. No, they're cut off. They're cut off. Because the covenant of Moses, you have to keep all the commandments. You have to abide in it. There, there, is, no, there is no life in the, in the law, except unless, you, unless you're a person that has kept all the commandments all the time, all of your life, then you obtain the blessings of the law. And only one person did that. That's Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He fulfilled the law. And because of what he did there and because of his sacrifice on the cross, he also took all the law off the, out of the way. I mean, he, his sacrifice, his death on the cross is the only sacrifice that can actually remove sin. And you don't have to bring an offering. He's the offering. You simply accept what he did. You believe in him and what he did on the cross. That's all that God requires. God does the rest. Just come to him. Throw yourself into his hands and say, save me. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Save me. Save me from myself. A lot of Christians don't even understand that. They don't understand what God has saved them from. The problem is you. The problem was me. Where did my sin come from? I didn't get it from someplace else. It came out of me. And there was a lot. That's when the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. That's what you find out. You're the problem. If, as long as you make somebody else the problem, 
The Palestinians are the problem. The Muslims are the problem. The society is the problem. No, it's, it's you. Until you realize that you're the problem, you won't come to God to be saved from yourself, from your sin. Oh, yeah, I want to be saved from the consequences of my sin, but I don't want to be delivered from being a slave to it, a slave to the evil that's in my own heart. I don't want my heart fixed because I love that stuff. Say that's why you have to be born again, born from above, a, a new creature in Christ. That's all promised in the Old Testament in the prophets, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. God enumerates what he will do, he himself will do, if you come to him. The new covenant, which is what Jesus did on the cross to buy. His blood, the blood of the new covenant is his blood. If you're a Christian and a communion, what is it? The, if, you, if you go to a church that actually repeats the words of Jesus, this is the blood of the new covenant. My blood, his blood. That I shed... He said. The disciples knew what he meant. That's why they didn't ask him any questions about it. You don't find this preach in church. I don't know why. It is so bizarre. But when you, at communion, whatever you call it, the Lord's Supper, or the, the, the cup that's supposed to be a cup of wine, and it should actually be one cup because we, to, to make the symbolism proper, one loaf, one cup. The loaf is broken and distributed. The cup, share the cup. That That's proper. I, yeah, we're afraid to do that. Or if you got a lot of people, it's, you know. But that's the real symbolism. It the But the, the cup of wine is that probably was the cup of redemption in the Passover meal. And he's, I'm sure that was the one he took. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This cup here that's of the Passover the deliverance from the bondage of Egypt, deliverance from the bondage of sin, deliverance from the world, the blood of the Lamb. My blood, he said. That's where forgiveness is, in him, only in him. It's not in a religious system that calls itself Christianity. It's in Christ alone. And what I'd say to the to to the Jews and Muslims, you know, you know there Jews, there is no salvation under the law. Don't you know that? And if there's no salvation under the law, because you have to keep the law, you have to keep the covenant to be not cut off. You have to keep the law perfectly. You know that if you've read and taken off your rabbinical Talmudic glasses and read what's actually said. But the law talks of one that will come who's like unto Moses, who brings a new covenant. And Moses says, whoever will not hear him, listen to him, shall be cut off. Who is that one? The Messiah. Messiah, Isaiah 53. The one who is rendered up as an offering for his people. Who is crushed for his people. Jesus Read the prophets. Read the law. Then read Matthew. Read John. Read Paul. Saul. Read Hebrews. Compare it to your Talmud. Where is life? Is it in the Talmud or is it in the gospel? Your gospel. Your Messiah. You understand that? He came and died for your sins. And not for yours only, but for the sins of the whole world, including the Palestinians, including the sins of Hamas, including the sins of Netanyahu and the Germans and the Japanese and even the sins of the Americans. Died for the sins of the whole world. So whosoever has faith in him is forgiven all things. No matter what you've done, you could not have any kind of forgiveness like that under the law of Moses. Not possible. And you know that if you know the law. 
There is nothing like this in the Quran. Nothing at all. There is nothing like Christ dying for the sins of the entire world and salvation through faith alone in him. All you have to do is believe him and cry out to God to save you. That's all that's required. It's not a religious system. Man's works can never reconcile you with God because you're sinful and he is holy. Only God's works can reconcile you with him. And that's what the cross, that's what Christ came to do. The Messiah was sent to make atonement for the sins of the entire world. As John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God. What do they sacrifice? Lambs in the temple. Lambs. Who takes away the sins of the world. Not just the Jewish people, the world. God's redemption is much bigger than a particular nation that comes from a particular man. But the promises God made to Abraham, the unconditional promises in the Old Testament, some 4,000 years ago now, were promises of unconditional blessings to him and to his seed. Not his descendants in general, but to a particular descendant, the Messiah the Christ. And that particular one is Christ. To, the promises were to him and to the Messiah, and in him, and in him alone. His, his name is the only name given on earth, the only name under heaven through which we must be saved. We must believe on him. Whether you call him Jesus or Isa or, or Yeshua or Jesus, none of this matters. God knows. God doesn't need a translator. He knows what's in your heart. If you're willing to come to him to be saved of what you are, of your own sinful heart, and to become a new person, a new creation, a truly a son of God, a child of God, it's available. The Gospel of John, the first chapter, he says about, about uh, the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, who is, begins by saying, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But he says in there, he came unto his own. He came to his own people, to the Jews, and they received him not. The majority of them did not believe on him. They did not receive him as their Messiah. Some did, not most. The leadership did not. But to, then he says, but to those who do receive him, to them he gives the right, the power, the authority to become the children of God, the sons of God. By receiving him, by accepting him for who he truly is and what he did for you. Faith in that. Confessing him as your Savior, as your Messiah, as your Lord. Following him. God doesn't require obedience for salvation, simply faith, because we're, we fail all the time. The law required perfect obedience. Christ doesn't. And we know what the Quran requires. There is no salvation in the Quran. There is in Christ. The Quran is not God's perfect revelation. Jesus himself is God's per perfect revelation. When Philip, his, his, one of his disciples, asked him, Lord, show us the Father that is enough, that at the last meal before his crucifixion, he said, Philip, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me? Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. There's a, you know, he's declaring himself to Philip that I'm God. I am him. I am he, I am, the, I am the I am. He repeatedly made that known. And several times they picked up, uh, his adversaries picked up stones to stone him because they understood he was declaring himself to be God, to be the very son of God. And I know the Quran says God has no son. 
Well, the Quran is not correct in that, unless you take that to mean he has no son in a crude way. Yes, the father did not become a, a take the form of a human being, come down and impregnate a, a female the way the Greeks would have understood it in their mythology. Besides, she was a virgin. No, it was not done that way. But yes, God did take on human flesh. He did become a man without ceasing to be God. Jesus came and it was incarnated in human flesh, our flesh, the flesh of a virgin. The seed of the woman, not the seed of Adam, not the seed of a man, the seed of a woman, God worked it in such a way. Yet that Christ would be truly a human being, truly a man, one of us, yet without sin. But yet he is also truly God. Because he said, no one has uh, ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even he who is in heaven. So while he was in us, among us as a man, he was also seated in heaven as God, at the right hand of the Father. Not three gods, one God. That is revealed to us as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Christians have struggled for millennia to explain that relationship, but we always fail. We recognize it when it's done wrong, like it's just God putting on different masks kind of stuff. That's not right. That's not consistent with the revelation that's given us in the scriptures. So we've come up with something we call the doctrine of the Trinity, not the doctrine of three gods, the doctrine of one God who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not just ways of appearing, but there's distinctions that are in God himself that we sometimes refer to as persons, although sometimes people struggle with that because they're not three individuals. We struggle with language to explain, but we can't explain God because he is God. And he has revealed these things to us, and we, we can't deny it. Not three, but one. As the Quran says, Christians don't say three. It'll be better for you. That's correct. We say one. I just want you to understand that. And the incarnation is not some crude idea that, that God came down in a human form and impregnated a, a Jewish virgin. No, not at all. Not at all. And something we can't really explain either. I've got plenty of theology books, and none of them even hardly attempt to deal with this. Why? Because well, they know enough not to try. But I have to say that uh, in the Quran, there is nothing. I mean, where is the atonement for your sins? God can't simply forgive sins. He is because he is just and he is holy. God simply cannot overlook sin. But the scripture uh, tells us, and especially in the book of Romans, the epistle to the Romans by the Apostle Paul, that, that in Christ on the cross, God was reconciling himself to, to, to the world. He was recon he, uh, In Romans, he said that, that Christ died on the cross that God might be both just, holy, true, righteous, uphold his law, and yet be the one who justifies, declares righteous sinners who believe in him, who trust in him, simply because they trust him, which is the faith he, he revealed to Abraham, who is the father of not only Jews, but the Arabs also, the father of Isaac and Ishmael, correct? And the, what was said to him, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him 
reckoned to him as righteousness. Believing God makes you right with God. Because of the cross, because God satisfied his justice in the death of an innocent man, his own son, that he might treat those who have faith in him as if they were without sin. He atones for our sin and for the sins of the whole world, but you, re you participate in that atonement through faith in him. Let me say something to, uh, well, both Jews and Muslims and a lot of other people, that God is consistent with himself. God does not contradict himself. So when, there's, when their prophets came, when Moses came and the prophets, though there is an expansion of God's revelation, a progression, a progression in the detail and the scope of God's revelation, Yet there is never a contradiction. God does not say something now that contradicts something he said in the past if you read it carefully. Some people th say there are, but there aren't. If you read it carefully, uh, and because obviously Muslims would agree with this, Jews would agree with this, Christians agree with this, God can't contradict himself. God cannot lie because he is God. He is truth. So the revelation, though it can be uh, increased in scope, in extent, in depth, from the beginning of revelation through the prophets, yet a prophet cannot contradict what God has previously said because God can't cr contradict what he previously said without, for example, fulfilling that, fulfilling the law. And then the la and we know that the law was only temporary. It wasn't meant to be the final revelation of God. But it, 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 even the law, Moses speaks of one who would come, that the people would have to listen to him, or they'd be cut off. That was the Messiah. That's Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, Esau. So the Quran, if it, if Quran, if Muhammad was truly a prophet, and we can say he was a prophet of, of the one God, the one true God, in that in that sense. So if but if Muhammad says things in there that are truly contradictory to the revelation given through Moses and the prophets and the Injil, the Gospels, the New Testament. Uh, then he wasn't a prophet, so because of the nature of God himself. So either the revelation Muhammad received was corrupted, or Muhammad believed he was a prophet and maybe wasn't fully a prophet. <laughs> or he was thought he was and got it from a bad source. I don't know. I'm not saying he he acted of malice. I'm, I'm sure he believed he was a prophet. I'm not saying Muhammad did not exist. Uh, but there's many things in the Quran that we look in the in the uh, in the law and the prophets and the New Testament, and Muhammad seems to have garbled up some things. Again, it might have been he might have had it right, and he simply it was not heard properly by those around him or not transcribed well, or something. But the Quran, if it is God's revelation, then it can't contradict God's previous revelation because the Quran accepts Moses and the Old Testament prophets and Jesus, Isa, Isu, uh, Isa, excuse me, Isa. And it highly exalts Isa, right? And accepts that he was born of a virgin, Mary, right? So you can't contradict what he said because God doesn't change his mind. Not in the sense of literally changing things. He says this here and he says something else here. If you can't reconcile those two things, 
well, then something can't, is wrong. There's something wrong, because God is not in contradiction to God. So, I'm, which is why I have a problem with the Quran. Unless you can reconcile the Quran with the previous revelation, I have to say, something happened somewhere there. But I'm new, in saying that, that Jesus Christ claimed himself that he is the perfect revelation of God, because he is God. See, you cannot be truly the image of God without being God, because any other, any other image would be less than him, right? Which is why idolatry is for, forbidden, correct? Muslims, you don't practice idolatry, do you? I don't practice idolatry. There's some Christians that do, but they're, they're wrong. They're wrong. They're, that's not what the Bible tells us, Old Testament or New. And you're right on that. I just want you to be right, more right when it comes to the Messiah himself. Because if he is the image of God, which he himself claimed to be, you can't simply dismiss all this stuff as the dis the corruption of his followers. You have to pr if you want to make that allegation, you have to prove it. And Christianity has a whole lot of manuscripts that go way back. And there was no recension where they were all gathered together and one perfect copy was was created and the rest were all destroyed. Which did happen in Islam, did it not? So you say, well, our copies of the Quran don't vary. Well, we have tiny variations among the manuscripts of Christianity, but they all teach exactly the same thing. I know. I have them in my system. I have done computer analysis on the variants. I, I know what kind of things they are. They don't change the teaching at all. Very minor things. But we, are, we have fragments that go all the way back to the end of the first century, or the very beginning of the second. Within a few years of it being written, the, the Gospel of John, probably written late in the first century. And these were, were documents, these Gospels, for example, the, of the Apostles, especially the, the primary Gospels are Matthew and John. Both were appointed as Apostles and were disciples of Jesus throughout his ministry. Matthew was a tax collector, and John was a fisherman. He was the youngest of them, and he wrote uh, uh, the Gospel of John, uh, first, second, and third epistles of John, uh, which are short things, and uh, the R book of Revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling, the return of Christ, and the events that precede the return of Christ, and follow after. And I know Muslims believe that Jesus, Isa, is coming again. Yes, we have that in common. And somebody on a comment mentioned that, said, I know that, I know that. So, uh, but what I do know and want to share with you especially is that in the Quran, there really is no, there's nothing like the atonement for sins that Jesus Christ came as his primary mission to accomplish that. That, that in him, all the sins of the world are forgiven. In him. So you have to be in him. You have to have faith in him. That's all God requires. That's all that God requires. And then God does the rest. God changes our heart. God writes his commandments in our heart. God changes us so, so rather than trying to obey an external code like the Ten Commandments, which were written on stone, he writes his law in our own heart. So we want to do, we desire to do the will of God. He is working to restore us to his purpose in creating man in the beginning, which to make man in his own image. And I am not fully in the image of God yet. Let's make that clear. But we will be. We will be when Christ returns in his glory then, then his people, those who trust in him, will appear with him, and we will be, the, the dead, dead in Christ will be raised, uh, raised, and those who are still alive on earth will be transformed instantly into his own glory. We will be 
perfectly conform to the image of the glorified Messiah. We will be truly the sons of God. And we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years on this physical earth. Not floating around in heaven playing harps like some goofy Christians have imagined because they didn't believe the scripture or they didn't have access to the scripture. Didn't pay much attention to it. They listened to men rather than to God. But true Christianity is Jesus Christ. That's it. Faith in him. It's not a religious system. It's not a system of works. It's not a system of earning salvation. It's a system of, it is a faith where we accept the salvation God has prepared for us all in his son who died on the cross for our sins and then rose again on the third day as the proof that God has given to all humanity that Jesus Christ himself is in fact the promised one. In fact, the one that saves us from our sins. In fact, the one in which we can be reconciled through faith in him to God. God reconciled himself to us, to sinners on the cross, took the problem of, the, of sin out of the way so that he is free to act toward us in mercy and grace and love toward people that are sinful. Now, we have to accept that reconciliation, put ourselves in his hands so he can work to complete his work, begin conforming us to the image of his son, to the image of God, which is why he created us. And again, that will take place for those who are in him when he returns. We will be transformed into his glory. Don't ask me to explain that in detail. Paul says that it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he truly is. I just want to leave you with that thought. In this world of madness, he told us that these things would take place before he returns. The, the rise, the, the explosion of lawlessness and apostasy, people departing from faith in God. And that's happening all around us right now. I just want, especially Jews and Muslims and everyone, to know that God has prepared a salvation for you that you can receive by faith alone in Christ, in the Messiah, in Yeshua HaMashiach, in Esau. It's already been bought and purchased for you. All you have to do is receive him and trust in him, confess him. It's all that God requires. He does everything else. He transforms us. We don't have to because it takes his power to do that. And he dwells in us, not, not when we're transformed. Now he comes and lives in us now. His spirit dwells in us. You become literally, even as this earthly body of clay in which sin still, still dwells because of the cross, we become the dwelling place of God Almighty. We are his temple, even in these mortal bodies. He is in us, his spirit, that is his promise to everyone who trusts in Christ. The promise of Christ, what he died on the cross for.